We have a guest speaker this morning, uh, although that's probably the wrong description because he's a part of our church. Uh, his name name is Obiudin Faliki, and uh, so honored that uh, he and his wife Kenny have chosen to make Life Point their home church. Uh, they are from Nigeria. Uh, I met Obiudin and Kenny. A gazillion years ago at Westwood Baptist Church when I was on staff there and um, loved them then. They went back to Nigeria for a period of 10 years where he pastored a Calvary Chapel church in a major city there. And then they came back here and have been here about five years. And uh, they settled in here at LifePoint to my astonishment and, uh, and great pleasure. And I, I, you probably don't fully understand this, but when you're a pastor and another guy who you honor and respect as a pastor decides to be a part of your church, <laughs> that's an honor. And uh, I'm honored to have the Felikis among us, and I'm honored this morning to welcome Abiodun, uh to the pulpit or the table or whatever this thing is. And uh, Abiodun, thank you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Shall we uh, pray, please? Father, we're just grateful. It's a blessing. Thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the book of John. Teach us your word this, this day by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. So shall we rise to read uh, First John chapter 3, the first 10 verses, please? Thank you. Okay, we can start. See what kind of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Beloved, we are God's children, Now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this is the evidence we are the children of God and the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Amen. Shall we be seated? I, I, I just want to say that it's a, it's a big honor for Pastor Jim to, uh, you know, uh, ask me to come and share. I, I thank God for this privilege. Honestly, uh, being a, you know, I understand for pastors, it's, it's difficult to, to bring people on the pulpit. And I, I understand that because you never know what kind of doctrine, what message, what word, what teaching they will bring. Uh, you know, for the flock. So I, I fully do, and I and I, I don't take it lightly. I bless God for this opportunity and the privilege, and also I just thank God for this for this group, this fellowship, this church. Uh, it, it's amazing. Um, my wife and I, we have three children: uh, twenty three, twenty one, and tw- and nineteen. And you know, the children church. Uh, uh, 2001, we've got to know Pastor Jim Hayes and the wife when we the growing families group. And uh, right, John Davis, our child, Tolu, was six or eight months old. 
when he passed through, um, all of our children, Sheyi, our daughter, was two years old when they passed through Pastor John Davis or Brad John Davis' hands and uh, Alexandra and uh, Yolanda, Ale- the John Alexandra Yolanda. These were our teachers for our children, and we blessed the Lord. Our, our daughter just graduated from UW uh, this year. Uh, she's uh, 22. So I bless God. I mean, you guys don't know what you have. This, these are wonderful people, faithful men and women. And also, you know, uh, Brad Ben Blocks. We've been friends for years. I know him. I know all his children. Uh, oh, is it Ben? Is your son Ben or your, your Ben? Okay, anyway, the blocks. Anyway, I don't know which one. So today, we, we don't, well, yeah, you know, we were in Africa. I was born and raised in Africa, but, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we were here. We became citizens here. And we went back for 10 years, 2006 to 2016. But our kids, when they became college age, we had to come back. And, uh, you know, they started their college, and we bless God for that. So today we're going to, uh, uh, I was given First John chapter 3. Uh, First John chapter 3, uh, it's a chapter that explains the privileges and love that God has for us as a Christian. Uh, oftentimes you don't understand, com- comprehend the love of God. When you say God loves us, God loves me, God loves you. We often don't understand such, priv- such privileges, what it, what it entails. We're going to see today. Also, we're going to see how God's love and plan for us now. And even, not only now, but also after life. You know, we're going to see the deepest, the depth of God's love, not only for this life, but after life, when I die, or when we take, when, you know, when we change, uh, when we go to heaven. What, what's the extent of this love? So, Apostle John also said uh, that believers should have, uh, should live a life of righteousness. Uh, and then, um, uh, since we can differentiate between, you know, uh, good and evil, so these are the things we are going to talk about today in First uh, John chapter 3. And so this chapter shows us a practical example of Christian daily living, First uh, John chapter 3. So let's see, see the first three verses. The first three verses, uh, uh, it shows, let's go there, the first uh, three verses, John, First John chapter 3. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth not us. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him, we shall see him as he is. And then verse 3. And every man that had this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. You know, I watched a movie. Uh, probably, you know, it's uh, more like not meant for children. But there's a movie that I watched. Some years ago, it's called uh, The Tale of a Night. It's about a, a story of a night. You have this young, poor, nobody, peasant, uh, who, who was just around. There was a night, a fight. They would fight on a horse, you know, fight themselves. And one of the knights, those, you know, big position guy, died accidentally during the, uh, during the competition, the contest. So they were looking for replacement. So it just so happens that this peasant, poor, nobody guy, was around to say, yeah, he's going to fight in place of the knight that just died. Well, he won the fight. And uh, from then on, he got involved with some friends. And then he found out that, wow, you know, he can make some money. So he, he got involved with some friends. And to, for you to be able to do that contest, you must be a knight, a super, you know, somebody. So they got some fake documents and fake everything, you know, finding his ancestors and all that. Came from, he said he came from one land nobody knows about. And he was able to get these fake papers and, and, and he, he, he began to get into these fights. And he won a lot of fights. But he was caught one day. They did the research and they found out that he was not a knight. He was a nobody. And for you to do that, to, to uh, pose like a knight, it's a death sentence. So he was supposed to be beheaded. The day he was going to be beheaded, people were watching. It just so happens that the, the prince of that country was just passing by. He had fought the prince before, and uh, the prince passed by and saw him on the gallows, ready to be beheaded. And the prince not only freed him, but also he, he initiated him into knighthood. He made him a knight. He said, no, you're a poor, you're a nobody, but with the way I've seen your hard work and what you do, you deserve to be a knight. And that's the story of actually First John chapter 3, the love of God for us. 
That what we don't deserve, what we don't even work for, God gives us on a platter of gold. So look at that. The first verse, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. I mean, uh, John, Apostle John was excited. Behold means be aware. Know this. This is unreal. This is not common. Apostle John is writing to celebrate and marvel at the love of God for us as Christians to be called children of God. You know, we cannot comprehend God's love. His reasons for sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us, for the whole world, and being adopted to be a child of God. It's impossible to figure out why God gave us this opportunity, you know, to be called children of God. And we see some scriptural verses that support this. You know, in the first book of, in first Corinthians chapter two, verse nine, it says, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepare for those that love him. Can you imagine that? That it is just beyond comprehension what God is preparing or has prepared for you and I, the privileges of being a child of God. And also, um, apostle Peter, one of the apostles too, was, was talking about this, that even the angels marvel at God's plan to make man children of God. The angels are like, what? These people? I mean, I mean you, you see that also in First Peter chapter 1 from verse 10 to 12. If you see that, you see it says, concerning the salvation of the prophets, uh, the salvation of the prophets who spoke of this grace that was to come to you, searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time of the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ is then in them was pointing when he, uh, when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories that will follow. It was revealed to them they were not serving themselves, but you. They spoke of things that have not been told by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. I mean, the love of God for us as humans just baffle the angels. Like, oh, wow. And also, you know, uh, with God's love as, uh, uh, is bestowed. He says, behold what my Lord, the Father has bestowed. It's a gift. We don't work for it. That God just gave us. You know, often, you know, often uh, also in the Psalms, the Psalms too wonder. It says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visited him. I mean, so we see many times and times that, you know, there's this marveling of the love of God for us as human beings. And that is what uh, John was dwelling on, that we should be called the children of God. The question is, uh, okay, so yeah, uh, in the morning I, I, I forgot to say this, but see, Muslims, because I grew up in Africa, 50, 40% of people in my country are Muslims. You see, Muslims say no one can be a child of God. Any, any Muslim, you find out. They say, no, you cannot be. And it's, it's even part of their Quran. Why? You see, but we can only be slaves or servants of God. I, I forgot to even say this. Because why? Because they say in their Quran, God beget no man, nor is he begotten. It is part of their Quran. Yes, if you ask it. So that's why Muslims will be shocked when you say you are a child of God. You are a children of God. You are children of God. No. They say, God beget no man or is he begotten. So the question is, how do you become a child of God? You see, how do I become a child of God? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Being a child of God is free. Also Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. It says, for by grace you are saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So the privilege is for us, it's free, and it's for all. So that was what um, John, Apostle John, was marveling. That's not, that is not all. Look at verse 2. He says, behold now, we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him. As he is. Wow. It does not yet appear what we'll be like. 
See, Christians have great things to look forward to. Not only in this life, being a child of God, being a son of God, but also after life. Being transformed into a new glorious body when we leave this earth. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back to take us to heaven. You know, I've been married for 24 years. Uh, my lovely wife. Uh, we're blessed with three children. You know, as I said, 23, 21, and 19. And, uh, you know, having, you know, I, I, I said also, you know, if I say that to my father-in-law, he would just say, you guys are babies. 24 years of marriage, you guys are babies. But what I'm getting at is this. I'm growing gray here. I'm getting old. Not only that, uh, I have this middle age spread at my mid, you know, my midsection. Something is happening here. But, but the good part is, you see, yeah, also, you know, I've been using glasses for 40 years. But when, see, but when Jesus comes back, I will be changed. I will be a different body, a glorious body. And Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he gave us a clue about this, what this new body will look like. Uh, Corinthians 15, 42 to 49. So also is the resurrection of the dead. See, it compares my body now and the body that God has, is pre- Jesus is preparing or has prepared for us. Afterlife. He says, see the comparison? My body now is sown in imperishable body. But in heaven, it will be an imperishable body. That's First Corinthians 15. It compares, it's sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. The third one, it is sown in weakness. Obviously, as you grow older, it is sown in weakness. You become weak and weak. But it will be raised in power. It is like Adam, a living soul. But I will be like Jesus, a life-giving spirit. It's a natural body right now. But I will be given a spiritual body. And lastly, it's an earthly body. This body we have, that is why when somebody is died and laid to the ground, they say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We're earthly. This body is going back to earth. But the new body is a heavenly body. So we see that comparison of what God has prepared or is preparing for us. Now, look at verse 3 of that first John. It says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. You see, this first three verses is telling us the prospect of heaven, spending eternity with God, being given the pillar to be called a child of God, and also knowing that my body, I will have, uh, 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 you know, my, I will be transformed when Jesus Christ comes, should motivate us to live a pure life or live a life that is pleasing to God. Purity means to be made pure, to be sanctified, to set ourselves apart for the use of God. You know, and then the next part talks about, from verse 4 to 11, talks about practicing righteousness or practicing sin. Verse 4, whoever committed sin transgetted also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. You see, the passage describes what sin is. Sin is, well, lawlessness. Missing the mark. Things that do not, doing things that do not please God. Rebellion. Doing things I want in contrary to what God wants. And he said, you know that he appeared to take away sin. That's the purpose why Christ came. This verse also talks about practicing sin, living in sin, or a sinful life. Living a picture sinful life. He says, if we abide in Christ, we ought not to live a sinful life. Now, from these verses down, it begins to give us practical example of how to live for God and practical example of people that do not live for God. You see, in Jesus, there is no sin. Sin here is singular. Jesus had and has no sin nature. 
he knows no, he knew no sin. We all as human beings were sinful. We have this Adamic nature. It happens to us when Adam and Eve sinned at the first, at the garden, the old man, the sinful desires, the dictates of the flesh. See, we do not, we, and we must not deceive ourselves. The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're sinners saved by grace. See, it does not mean Christians do not sin or cannot sin. It means sin for a Christian should be a mistake, an accident, and not a way of life. So that is what he is saying here, that he who is practicing sin should check himself out. As a Christian, I do not feel comfortable in sin. I feel guilty. The Holy Spirit convicts me. Have you ever noticed that as Christians, we oftentimes do not get away with anything? The Holy Spirit doesn't let you get away. You know, I have this joke. You know, it's, it's not a joke. It's a true life story. Here's a guy. He went to rob a bank. And he was successful. He robbed a bank. He got a lot of money. And guess what this guy did? He called his mom for a ride. <laughs> and the mom said, son, where are you? Uh, yeah, I just uh, at the bank. Uh, to do what? Where I, mom, I need a ride. And, and mom really called the ride for him. He called the, mom called the cops. See, so, so, so the thing is, yes, I mean, that, that oftentimes we don't get away with anything. That's what happens. That's for Christians. Uh, and, and, and then, it, so it continues. Uh, verse 11, for this is the message that I heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then he, he now began to uh, uh, differentiate between living righteous lives or living uh living an evil or unrighteous lives and give, begin to give examples for us. So, uh, so what was John talking about in verse 11? For this is the message that we have read from the beginning that we should love one another. See, the message is the same. Jesus also gave the same message. That you love one another, Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. And here are some practical examples. Now, John, Apostle John now began to tell us how not to love. From verse 12, not as Cain. These are examples he's beginning to give us for practical Christian living to know how to love and not how not to love. So not like Cain. What did Cain do? Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and he slew his brother. And wherefore slew him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. For we know that we are passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Not like Cain, who was of the evil one. Now, this was the first murder in the Bible, the first murder in the book of Genesis, the book of beginning. Both Cain and Abel, his younger brother, were born and raised by the same parents, Adam and Eve. Cain means, the name of Cain, the name means, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. That's what his name means, Cain. Abel was a shepherd, keeper of flocks, animals, while Cain was a tiller of ground. A crop farmer. They, they each offered sacrifices to God. And God had regard for Abel's offerings. And had no regard for Cain's offerings. Cain became very angry. His countenance fell. Still, God came to Cain. And asked why his countenance fell. And he was angry. And God then gave him solutions for the wrongdoings that Cain chose to do. You know, in Genesis 4, 7, God said, if you do well, will your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is grouching at the door. It desire is to have you, but you must master it. Sin is grouching at the door. God was still, be, with what Cain did, or Cain offered whatever he did, God was still offering solutions for Cain. Well, what did Cain do? Cain killed, Cain tricked his brother, Abel, to go to the farm with him. And he killed Abel, his brother. That's the first murder in the Bible. So the question is, why do we sin? 
Where does sin come from? Well, because Adam and Eve sinned by disobeying God and listening to Satan, the world then and now is a fallen world. And we have the sinful nature in us, inherited from Adam and Eve, the sinful desires, dictates of the flesh, the Adamic nature. Cain made a decision not to love his brother and choose to offer unacceptable sacrifices to God. Cain was going through all the religious motions, but deep down, he was far from God. God gave opportunities for Cain to repent, but he refused and chose to kill his brother. The Bible encourages us not, not to be like Cain, but to love our brothers and sisters. So, it's giving us practice not to love this, not to hate, not to, this is not the type of love God wants us to love. And then that he hated his brother. But look at verse 10, 13. Now we're going to talk about hatred or persecution. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you, you know that I have passed from death unto life. Not that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abided in, uh, not his brother abided in death. It means detest, love less, persecute. See, Christianity is counterculture. We should refuse to join the crowd if, in rejecting God's, uh, God and his moral laws. We are increasingly branded social misfits, enemies of humanity and enemies of the state. Like salt on an open wound, we are painful reminder that God exists, that God has given moral laws to all human beings to live by the, by that, uh, by that and that the day of reckoning is coming. That's what the world hates us. Because we're, we're a reminder to their conscience that God exists. If you say, I will pray about something, you will be mocked and laughed at in this society. In our society, we do not have prayers or Bible studies or even national anthem in schools. Can you imagine that? I remember in the 80s, I was in my, late, I was in my 20s, in the 80s, I was in California, an exchange student. When President Ronald Reagan, I was, I was there. He declared one of the years in the 80s, the year of the Bible. And what happened since then? He says, if the world hates you, that is what Jesus even said, that he hated me before they are hated. Then I, I also have some examples of persecution. What are examples? How can we bring it to a practical level? It says, you might be warned or sued or fired at your workplace if, you're, if you have an open Bible on your desk. Somebody might even complain that it's offensive. That could be part of persecution. In Nigeria, that's my country, uh, where we have 40% Muslims, if you come from a, uh, from a Christian background, and you work in a Muslim-dominated state. We have about 36 states. You might be told by your higher authorities that, listen, this position that we know you qualify for, that you might get promotion for, what we want you to do is to convert to Islam. If you don't, sorry, you're going nowhere. And there's nothing you can do. These are talking about persecutions. Also in China, you might be sentenced to concentration camp because they said they want to reprogram your mind because you're a Christian. So, what is this First John chapter 3 is saying? There are three tests for Christians. The first test is, do we believe what the Bible teaches as truth? That's the first test. The second test is, do we show the love of Jesus in us to others around us, especially to fellow Christians? And then the third test is, has the, has the way I live my life daily been changed since I gave my life to Christ? Because as a child of God, we might be, we must be, there must be changes. We're getting to be like Christ. He's changing us. 
How was I last year? How was I two years ago? I mean, there must be that change, you know, as we, as we go on. So, let's talk more about the love of God from verse 16. See, John, Apostle John began to expand this love that God has for us from that verse 16. He says, whereby passive with the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I mean, so he now explained to us what love is. That love is God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, laying down his life for me and for you. And we should do likewise. According to the verse, God demonstrated or showed us what love is, how to love. The world, Hollywood, musicians, philosophers have tried to use to tell us about love. So the question is, how many songs or poems or novels or dramas are written about love? Answer? It's impossible to answer because love is one of the most common themes in music. There are many millions of songs about love. Losing love. Finding love. Falling in love. Missing love. Wishing for love. Searching for love. Being grateful for love. So what is love? You can say, you know, in English, English is a very, um, a very limited language. So what is love? See, we can say, I love my dog. I love you. I love my wife. I love ice cream with pickles and mustards on top. <laughs> I love habaneros, baking avocado flavored ice cream. I mean, I, so what is love? You see, in the English language, love is described by one word. But the Bible in the New Testament written in uh, Greek language describes love in three, four, three, four different ways. The first one is eros, erotic love, sensual love, sexual love, husband and wife type of love, passionate love. That's eros. The second love is philia, where you get the word Philadelphia, brotherly love, friendship love, partnership. It's the highest form of love humanly possible. But the fourth one, oh no, the third one is storage, or storage love, what that is. It's a, it's a family love, love between child and parents, love between families. But the love that says, Whosoever is uh, talk, talking about here in verse 16, whereby we perceive the love of God is agape. A love that loves without changing. It's a self giving love that gives without demanding or expecting or repay. It is love's great, it is love, it is love great that it can be given to the unlovable, unappealing. It is love that loves even when it is rejected. Agape love gives. And loves because it wants to and not loved in order to receive. That's God's kind of love. And he says, that's what he's saying here about this is how we perceive love. How do I know God loves me? How do I know? Well, we see here in verse 16 that God demonstrated that he loves me. He sent Jesus Christ to die in my place. The sinless one became sin. For me. If a man tells a woman, I love you, you know, oftentimes what it means is it's a selfish love towards uh, towards her. It's I want something from you, not you, but something from you. I do not want to wait. I want it immediately. But you see, God's love is demonstrated in many ways. In in Romans 5 8, he says, God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. See, here we see from John, Apostle John, giving us practical examples how to love our brothers and sisters. Christianity is practical, down to earth, laying down our lives for our fellow Christians, sacrifice. Love is demonstrated in action. 
Let us not love with words alone. How do we do that? We can pray for each other. We can give a phone call or find out how we're doing. We can help financially if it's need be. We can visit each other. We can get involved in any of the groups so that we can know each other. That's what he's saying. Now the next, next part is talking about verse 19. It talks about uh, the assurance of loving fellow Christians. See verse 19 says, And whereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before, before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us, not, then we have confidence towards God. You see, by loving our brothers and sisters, we will know we are all, we are of the truth according to God's word. This assures our hearts, gives us assurance we are living in truth. Many Christians live with guilt or self-condemnation. But we are told that once we confess our sins and forsake them, we should not let the devil or your heart beat you down with condemnation or guilt. And that is what the Bible is saying here. If our heart does not condemn us, God is, even if our heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. That I need not move around with condemnation or guilt. Christ has paid it all. I should not beat myself down because of whatever it is. Maybe I've made mistakes in time past. So lastly, you know, we'll just uh, round up in, in that verse 23 and 24. And this is the commandment that we have. And when we believe on the name of the Son, of, of the Son Jesus Christ, and love one another, he, give, he gave us commandments. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And whereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given unto us. You know, be, be, before we, we, we end that, look at verse 22. And whoever, whosoever, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing to him or to, in his sight. You know, sometimes some of these faith, name it, claim it, preachers use this. They say, the Bible says, whatever you, you want or ask, just ask. You will receive. But oftentimes you don't, you know, we read the Bible very well. You know, the Bible is not saying anything you want, you ask, you will do. No, that's not what this passage says. Look at verse 23. Whatever we ask, we receive in him because we keep his commandments. That is number two. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see? Do I obey his commandments? Do I live a life that pleases the Lord? Then he will do what I ask. Because once I spend time with God, my asking or what I desire becomes his own desire. The word of God influences what I ask for, not what I want, but what he will do through us. So, I think that's what he's saying. So, lastly, the last thing is talking about the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, 23 and 24. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he has, as he gave us commandments. Verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him, and whereby we know that he abided in us by the Holy Spirit which he has given us. The assurance is this that as we love one another, that he dwells in us, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And we are sure that he, he dwells in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, um, I, I, I was living this, uh, this, um, this illustration. You know, layaway, when you want to buy something, you can't afford. I mean, you now put it on layaway. It's a down payment. So, uh, with understanding that when you get the money, I, I used to do that a lot in those days. I put something in layaway, and then when I get my money, I go back and finish the payment, and I get, and I get excited. I get that thing back. The same way is the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave that Holy Spirit to us as a deposit, as a guarantee that He's coming back. He's coming back. 
to get us, to change us. The same way like a, a, a man, if you, if you propose to a woman, you give her a ring, an engagement ring. The thing is, if you're coming back, there's a wedding to look forward to. The same way, the Holy Spirit is just like that. Jesus telling us that he's coming back to not only transform us and, and to take us to heaven. So, so in a nutshell, what we've talked about is the love of God. The wonderful love that oftentimes we don't, we don't comprehend. And the practical Christian way out to love one another as he has loved us. Uh, so shall we, shall we pray? Father, we're grateful to this morning for First John chapter 3 to reveal to us how deep your love is for us. We, we do not deserve it. But it's just an unmerited favor. We thank you. Indeed, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called children of God. Thank you. And thank you for telling us how to love. The practical example of our brothers and sisters. Thank you for the prospect of heaven. And we're going to be changed. This body to a glorious body. Thank you for all these plans you have for us. Help us every day. Teach us how to love. And grant the grace to live for you. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen.